Wedgeside Podcast is a proud member of the Wedgeside Media Collective. This episode is brought to you by the Wedgeside Podcast membership program. Yeah, we recently revamped our program to include a lot more things. You can get your blah, blah, blah. I just don't know what to say. I need to write things down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dum dum. Besides including our back catalog of bonus episodes and new membership content, you also get things like free shirts and free bandanas, as well as shout outs on the show. So check it out. You can become a member for as little as ten dollars. So yeah. And it really helps out the show. It's like the most direct way you can help the show. Because all of that money just goes directly into the production of the show and making sure we can get an episode out every single week. Just go to whichsidepodcast.com, click on the members tab, and become a member. This is episode 158. Yeah, we talked to Rachel York from NARN, also known as Northwest Animal Rights Network. You can check out everything they're doing at narn.org. That's N-A-R-N dot org. I love the stuff that they're doing. Um, I am totally in love with their mentorship program. Um, I check it out. And if you don't live in the Northwest, copy that program, please. It will help the community in general. Yeah, they were so awesome when I was in prison and I can't thank them enough. So, No, Rachel's awesome, so stick around for that conversation. But Jordan, what news and MS do we have going on this week? On November 20th, it's the Transgender Day of Remembrance. You can find out more info on that at tdor.info. On November 19th, it's the Black Lives Matter poster making party with Narn. So check that out, narn.org. Yeah, we talk about that a little bit in the in this episode. If you're listening to this on the day it was released, we are also doing Salt Lake City's Anarchist Black Cross Prisoner Letter Writing Night at the library. And if it's later than that day or you don't live in Salt Lake City, fucking write our prisoner anyways. Just do it. You don't need a special day for it. This week's listener shout out comes from Charlotte Malridge. Charlotte's super awesome and once again said that we could shout out whatever we want. So I'm going to shout out the campaign Support Nicole and Joseph. You can find out more about that at supportnicoleandjoseph.com. I recently made some support stickers for them that you can pick up over there. So you should go check those out. Grab, grab some stickers and help fight repression. They're pretty sweet stickers, by the way. Thanks. For the slingshot this week, November 19th, 1930, was the day that Bonnie and Clyde committed their first robbery. Wow. Yeah. If you like these little tidbits of history, pull them out of the slingshot personal organizer. Right now is the best time to get one. Go to your local info shop, pick one up, and get organized. And learn these fun little facts. If you don't have a local info shop, you can get one at an online info shop like AK Press. I really hope you enjoy this episode. So, where, where you're located in Washington, is that right? Yeah, in Seattle. Yeah, how how is the Seattle scene right now? What? Well, which part? You mean the animal rights scene? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's pretty good. I mean, we have I I'd like to say that we have a really good community, and I'd like to think that you know my group, Animal Rights Northwest Animal Rights Network, is part of that because we try to try to keep that that's part of what we want to do is keep the community going because people are less likely to be involved if they don't feel part of a community. So I hope it's that other people feel it's going pretty well. I mean, 
I think uh, there's some little other people um, that start little, I don't know why it's put, not, pop-up group isn't the right way to put it, but there's been some um, direct action now kind of branches that have started up here and they're, I think they're having some backlash towards what's been happening in Berkeley, but they're very much their own group. So, mm-hmm. um, and they, they do stuff with NARN and we try to help them out. So it's not like, oh, you're part of this group or you're part of that group. It's just, we all do stuff together. So I like that. I don't really want to be competing with other groups. And that's kind of something I'm proud of is that we really do want to work with everybody. And it's not about what group you're with. It's just you wanting to get out there and do stuff with her animals. I've, I've always found it funny how sometimes people are like, no, it has to be under this name or no, it has to be under this name <laughs> instead of just be like, why can't we just fight for the fucking animals? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, we don't, Narn has not really ever cared about who gets credit. It's just we want to get stuff done. So it's, um, sometimes that's hurt us a little bit just in terms of people don't know that we did something because we haven't shouted that it's Narn doing it, but we mm-hmm. don't, yeah. again, we don't just, doesn't particularly care. We just want to make sure that stuff gets done regardless under whose name. So how did you start uh, getting involved with Narn? Um, well, I started getting involved with Narn because I actually, my first bit of animal rights stuff was through AFA years ago in like 2000. And I did, I think, leafleting for ducks in front of Whole Foods. And then I discovered Narn and that was just a better fit for me. And I've just been doing stuff with them ever since. <laughs> <laughs> so, so why did you, what made it feel like a better fit? Uh, because it was more, I thought of a, a community, like people hung out together. They had, they we went over to J- Joe and Che's house and had like poster making parties. And it was more of a, um, I'm not sure family is the right word, but you know, we were a bunch of friends that went out and did things together and it was fun. <laughs> Mm-hmm. it made animal rights stuff fun and we did creative things and um it was just good people involved and i still have a lot of those people who are my friends today do you still have so, that same level of fun like right now um we're older so it's a different <laughs> 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 and it, it's such a it, like with the internet and stuff there's so much stuff that goes online and um so i do think it's different we don't exactly have as many poster making parties over at somebody's house, you generally will have to rent out a space or something like that because it's it's just harder to to find to somebody to go over somebody's house because somebody's ordered to a cat or or they don't have enough space or you know. Yeah. I haven't been to a poster making party in probably like twelve years. And they were always a riot. <laughs> Well, we're going to have one next week, actually. We're going to have one. Um, there's actually a pizza place. Not Fortunately, it's not too far from my house. And they have some banquet rooms that they let people use for free. And the the place is really vegan friendly. So we're going to do a poster making party to encourage people to make posters for the Black Lives Matter March uh-huh. after Thanksgiving. Awesome. So I'm looking forward to that. And we're, we still need to come up with some suggestions. I mean, I know... I have ideas of like what people shouldn't be writing on posters. (laughs) I really need some more. I need to reach out to some friends and like, give me some ideas besides just black lives matter. You know, you gotta like, let's be creative, but not offensive. (laughs) (laughs) I haven't even begun to think down that, that path with the, with, uh, with black lives matter only because, I mean, I've been to like rallies and things, but not as far as like, you know, how, what posters should we make? That's Mm -hmm. interesting. Like what, what, um, are you, are you focusing on just Black Lives Matter or are you trying to do more intersectionality with it? We just want to be supportive. We don't want to try and I think that gets into to, creates too many sticky wickets to try and, and um, like, hey, here are the animal rights people. Let's uh, put our agenda on yours. We just want to be there and be supportive, not not try to. And it's, it's a pretty big group. So I think it might be hard to um, have a deeper relationship at this point just because it's not really clear like who is leading per se and so for now i think we just want to be supportive and then maybe we can say like hey how can we work together instead of us coming up to them like let's work together without showing that we've done yeah. anything yeah that's I, awesome i was yeah I, I was i'm very glad that that's the plan because i was kind of worried at first <laughs> No, that's one of the things that we're going to talk about. And I'm going to put up a blog post beforehand and stuff to talk to people like, look, we're not there to 
to pass out why vegans or or say why you should be on the animal rights agenda. We're just there to be an ally and yeah. support. Yeah, that, that's awesome. That is that is really awesome. Um, I've never really seen like animal rights groups get out there and be supportive of non-animal rights campaigns without trying to have without that trying to have yeah, an agenda. Exactly, so that's awesome. Well, yeah, I that's one of the things we're trying to work on, and and I it took. When I was younger, I was all like, oh, let's just go to that march. We'll pass out white vegans because I didn't really get it. Um, so it's, it's taken me a little while to, <laughs> to understand that you should just sometimes be quiet and yeah. just be supportive of another group's do, efforts. Do you have like an aha moment when that happened for you? Uh, I, you know, it's funny. I, I come to realizations a little more slowly. Like a lot of people have vegan anniversaries and things like that. And I was... I was a slow vegetarian and I was a slow vegan. So I don't, I know the moment that I decided that I would, well, I wanted to be serious about veganism, but I don't remember the date or anything. So I don't have any of those vegan anniversaries. And I, and I can't say it was an aha moment because I've always tried to be pretty aware. It's just, and then I think I bec- um, also just become more aware of, of how racism is still so pervasive and there's still so many problems. So it's just become more, um, I guess I've been reminded more of like, shit, things are still really bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> so have, have uh, you, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I've always been kind of jealous of people who know their vegan anniversary dates because it's a good excuse to eat vegan food, <laughs> more vegan food. Well, yeah, you don't really need an excuse. And in Seattle, it's all over the place. So, <laughs> yeah, I know the year. I know sometime, and I'm, I'm, I think I know. The season, it's one of two seasons. So I'm like down to like <laughs> maybe seven or eight months that I know when it happened. <laughs> I, know I just general. know the year. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even and know I if I know the year. And I think it was probably the summer because I remember the conversation that I had with somebody because they made, I had some uh, like almond cheese or whatever that was, that it just still had casein in it. And they made some snarky remark like, well, I guess, <laughs> what was it? Something they said, uh. I, you know, I, I can't remember at this time, but they made some snarky remark about the, the cheese I had in the fridge. And I thought, well, hmm, okay, I guess I really need to, like, cut that out and just go vegan. Do you do you feel like that, like, snide and snarky remark was, was better than someone approaching, like, as a, like, that sucks that they put casein in these, but just so you know, casein is blah, blah, blah. I think it was, I'm not sure that would work on everybody. It was just, it, it was one of those moments where they were, it just was, cause they were trying to, they were, I guess they were trying not to, try not to be obnoxious. So they didn't really mean to be, they weren't rude. It wasn't really like a rude thing to say. It was just, I think they said something like, well, it's a start. And, and I thought, huh, it, it, I guess it, you know, it kind of made me really think about it more. Yeah. Cause I knew, I knew what Kaysen was. It was just. I hadn't really given it much thought. I yeah. just hadn't thought about it enough. And, and just that remark made me think, ah, shit, you know, I should really be serious about it. I, I think when and, I, when I first met Jeremy, I was, I was still vegetarian and he called me like a hypocrite. And I think that's what made <laughs> Oh, no, no. I thought you were vegan. Uh huh. And I was making a rant about how vegetarians are fucking hypocrites. Just <laughs> to like three other like people in the car, like your sister was there stuff like that. And I'm just like, one of those rants and I, I just thought you were vegan at that point yeah yeah <laughs> so, i yeah. don't even think at that time because this was in 2000 because th- now that there's so much focus on dairy and how terrible it is and back then i don't remember there being such a huge focus on it i think for me it was just i hadn't been careful about reading the ingredients and so I, it was just kind of myself you know in an internal conversation saying with myself saying that i really should pay attention to ingredients and it really did matter and me telling myself that I it mattered. It mattered. Every single time I bought something that had an animal product in it, mm-hmm. whatever it was. It, that, that's kind of funny, the whole cheese thing, because the only reason I kind of know when I went vegan was because about a month and a half after I went vegan, um, my mom noticed, because I was like 13 at the time, and she's like, you're vegan now, aren't you? <laughs> because I hadn't eaten any cheese ravioli. <laughs> <laughs> And we got into a huge fight, and I remember storming out, thinking it's chilly outside. <laughs> That's the only reason I know about when it was. <laughs> yeah. Well, my parents were very. I I think I drove them crazy because I was slowly going vegetarian in college. So every time I came back home, I was I had stopped eating something. Mm-hmm. 
you know, so I came home for Christmas and like, oh, now I don't eat chicken. No, now I don't eat this. And now I don't eat, like, <laughs> surprise. You know? So I'm sure they're like, God damn it. You know, they thought it was some phase or whatever. And, and then finally I stuck with it and kept going more towards veganism. And they were, they've been very supportive, quite honestly, but I'm sure I drove them crazy every time I came back from college with some other thing I didn't eat. Did they ever have, like, do you ever, ever have a moment with them where they're like, hey, they had that realization with you, like, I know this isn't a phase, I know this is lifelong, and we're just here and accept it now? No, I don't think really they had that conversation. I think, I mean, I've, they've always known me to kind of, if I wanted to do something, I was going to do it. So they just, okay, <laughs> conversation, it was just my decision that I was going to do something and they could support it or not. <laughs> Do you do you have one uh, like one of those relationships where it's kind of like uh, we won't ask, we won't argue kind of things, or does it always confrontation there? Well, my dad likes to have uh, discussions. He doesn't really mean it to be an argument, but he will like poke at me, and he he made some comment one time about, well, "What about all the cows? If you don't eat the cows, <laughs> like they'll take over the earth," kind of thing. <laughs> and, <laughs> that one. And so, yeah, I talked to him about it, and then he kind of. He, shut up because he realized I was being very serious about it and no in fact cows won't take over the earth and so he occasionally he'll he'll say things but then because I actually have a counter argument he he accepts that so he he kind of likes those conversations he doesn't mean for it to be an argument he just he's he'd rather talk about politics than about personal stuff so he'd rather talk about like environmental issues or I don't know he's just that's the I'm sure you probably have you know, other people like that that don't would don't want to talk about their feelings, but they'd love to talk about politics. <laughs> yeah. 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 I was I was gonna say I always liked seeing those like vegan bingo cards. I don't know if you've seen those. It's just like they all the all the excuses or things that people always say and you can put a bingo point on it or a bingo chip on it. Oh. Yeah. It's like, well what if you were on an island and the only thing you could blah blah blah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he, he hasn't asked me that one yet. But I think honestly, my the things that my mother does drives me a little more crazy because she'll talk about, oh, those those sweet animals, they're so lovely. I'm like, but mom, you are still eating dairy, which gives you arthritis. And <laughs> why don't you? <laughs> That's kind of a no brainer. You know, your fans might feel better if you stopped eating dairy. Well, I don't eat that much of it. <sighs> I have that exact. My, so my mom has rheumatoid arthritis and her doctor has told her to cut out dairy and she used to change her diet. I've had the conversation with her multiple times and she's just like, no, I'm going to die. That's okay. <laughs> I'm just like, fucking hell. Like, I can't have a conversation with her. Yeah, I think friends and family are the hardest. And I, you know, my parents know all of the reasons and I'm not going to, I don't know. I kind of, I just don't want to get into it with them almost just because I, they're just not going to change. I mean, they, they have all the information. So mm -hmm. I'd rather yeah. not get, have a big conflict there because because they are very supportive of me when I do visit them they have vegan food there so I don't I don't mm -hmm. want to start in on them if they've been that supportive you know I, I feel lucky in that aspect as well that my parents are pretty supportive um, in pretty much everything I do now except when it comes to uh, animal rights politics um, and atheism we just agree not to bring it up <laughs> <laughs> so. well why had but when the WTO come, came to town and there was that big protest down in downtown Seattle, mm -hmm. I went. Um, and I didn't. I wasn't part of any group or anything. I just wanted to go down there and be part of the protest. And my parents lived up on Capitol Hill at the time, and so I came after going to one of the, you know, one of those big days where there's all the stuff going on. I came home and chatted with my parents about what it was like, and and my dad says, "Well, you know, I don't agree with you, but I'm glad you're standing up for something you believe in." <laughs> I wish more 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 kids had that experience with their family. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty lucky with my parents, honestly. So I wish I would have gotten to that. My my parents at least became anti government as soon as the FBI raided their house. They were like, Oh, this is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> not mine. <laughs> yeah, not yours. Yeah. <laughs> That's one experience that will uh, <laughs> get you there. <laughs> So what are the things that you guys do with NERN that I am super intrigued by? I want to know more about is the mentorship program. Yeah. 
I love that. That was one of our um, longtime board members' ideas. He's like, well, you know, people don't. There's always the issue of people don't not staying vegan. People go vegan, but they don't stay vegan. So how about we start this mentor program? And it has taken a little bit to get off the ground, just because for us to get the word out there, and we had some issues with just getting it properly set up. But it's I love the idea. I love being able to hand people a little mentor idea, mentor card, and because people will say, oh, I'm, you know, I want to go vegan, but I don't really know what to do. So I'm, I'm so happy we were able to get that going, even though it's had, it had a bit of a, a rough, slow, rough start just because we are all volunteers and sometimes emails don't get checked. <laughs> so, so how does the program actually work? So we now have somebody, her name is Kat and she's administering it. And so people will fill out a form basically. So if they want to be a mentor, they, they have a one, um, it's kind of like a little brief questionnaire and then the same thing with the mentees as we call them. So you kind of try to match people up. Um, so if you're a person that likes to cook, you'd be matched up with somebody that also likes to cook. So for me, I'm okay with cooking, but I would, it would not be good if I were matched up with a mentee that's really into fancy cooking because I couldn't help them <laughs> or if they had kids. So we, so she just tries to, to kind of at least match them up with, with some similar interests. And if she can't find a match, then she'll generally just ask one of us to to help them out. Because sometimes it doesn't take very much. It just um, a couple I had a couple mentees, and it really just took a conver- couple conversations, and they like, oh, okay. You know, they just needed like a little a little push. Mm-hmm. So sometimes that's all it takes. Does it kind of operate like um like the AA sponsors? <laughs> It's really dependent on the two, the whoever is set up together. So if they want to have, if they want to go have coffee, that's up to them. If they just want to have an email conversation, it's up to them. So we try to really leave it, kind of have it hands off and, and leave it up to the people that are matched up together, how they want to work on it. And then um, Kat will ask the mentees, how's it going? Just And if it's not going well, then she can try to match them up with somebody else. I'm I'm sure that this program addresses this, but one of the things that I've also seen um, kind of a failure on with in the animal rights scene is like when people have hiccups in their veganism, you know, like people will be like, oh, well, I had cheese, not not necessarily accidentally, but I did it. uh, And then but reinforcing that it's okay to come back. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Yes. It's not like, oh, my God, you're not a vegan anymore. You know, it's just those things happen. and, And we too try to to talk about that. I mean, there's times when I've been traveling or just, or out at a restaurant and I'm sure, and I maybe didn't ask the right questions and I ended up with a button that probably had some dairy in it. It's, you know, but, you just try to do your best you can. And that yeah. you do try to emphasize that is it's really harder to be a perfect vegan in this world. So the whole point is to do the least amount of harm. And if you slip up intentionally or not, then just forgive yourself and move on. Elsa, I seems the one that bugs me when I'm traveling in buns. How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, so right now, the, the mentorship program is only in your locale, right? Like it's it's not like something you guys have expanded anywhere else. We yeah, I mean it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to matter locale. It's just a matter of of us not really being able to support it being too large because mm-hmm. we have a person administering it. Like we had more more people on you know, helping out with the program, then it really doesn't matter the region. Um, although, you know, you're not going to have the same grocery stores. Like uh, we commonly tell people you can actually go to Fred Meyer and get food, but that may not be true in Montana. So yeah, in, t- in, in terms of like shopping experiences, then it does, it does get more difficult because m- if I were to be matched up with somebody in Missoula or something, I wouldn't be able to tell them what restaurants to go to, or I mean, they, they have the co-op there, but <laughs> it's, you know, there, sometimes it does matter in terms of location. So it, it'd be harder to to guide people if you weren't in this in a yeah. similar area. What I think is like kind of amazing is that I can see all the challenges of getting it started, but once you kind of iron those out, it would operate pretty smoothly. So mm-hmm. what I think would be amazing and maybe I'm just opening my mouth where I shouldn't be was like if you could export that to other regions where other people could come in and be like like hey, this is what we did, now run with it in your own area. Well, there have been. I mean, and I'm pretty sure Vegan Outreach has started one. I think they have a vegan mentor program right now. Oh, I did, I was unaware of that. Yeah. 
And so, I mean, them, they're being a big organization as they can support it much better. So mm-hmm, when I found out about that, I don't know if we were the first one. It'd be cool to think that we were, <laughs> but I have seen it pop up in other areas. So I've only it, ever it seen like um, individuals trying it themselves, not like actual organizations before. Mm-hmm. I think it does help to have, a, have an organization behind mm-hmm. it because there's, the, well, you know, you have more of an infrastructure and it just it does help to have a more of an organization and just rather one person trying to to do it all yeah i just i love the idea of that first it seems so it's like just helps the community in general you know yeah yeah and i think i think as a community like you were saying before we don't support our community enough when it comes to everything we're very self-critical we're very analytical and we're, we're quick to point out like you're fucking up here but <laughs> um not hey let's get better together you know yeah yeah it's true and honestly sometimes we struggle a little bit because we can see things that we at NAR and as an organization we see things that we don't like that's going on in another group but we don't want to just start bad mouthing people publicly so we it is sometimes a little bit hard to figure out well how do you address something that you see as wrong without just bad mouthing them publicly or I mean you can I guess you can have a conversation but what if you don't know anybody there or what if they take it the wrong way it's kind of like how do you how do you um not be critical but point out things that maybe aren't okay without being a dick about it because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. you should yeah we do want to be supportive but it, there are some things that aren't okay that happen in the animal rights movement that do need to be pointed out. So it's like this fine line between being critical and, and calling out. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I think like so much calling out is, is, isn't done in the, the spirit of that helping hand. It's done in that spirit mm-hmm. of that pushing down, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> That's one of the things for problems about Facebook is people, <laughs> this group, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Yeah, that's why I don't have Facebook. <laughs> Sometimes well, I wish the I only reason I joined Facebook was to network. And it, I mean, it's been pretty nice. And if people are posting negative posts, I just don't read it. Yeah, I would just hate to have to like tell like family members and things like, no, don't, don't, don't follow me. Don't, don't do this. <laughs> don't even talk about that right now with me. Oh, yeah. You had a, you had a horrible <laughs> weekend, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. I'm lucky. The only family member I have on Facebook is my mother, and I put her on there so she could look at pictures. And she really, she's you know, she's reasonably tech savvy, but she doesn't. It's not like she's really on Facebook, so I don't worry about her <laughs> yeah, things that I don't want her to. So you you talked about um, like the WTO protests and everything, but what what has been your most memorable um, activist moment? Um. Well, I did a bike ride that was pretty cool. <laughs> that was, I'd love to do that again. What, what was, was that? About? What was the bike ride about? Yeah. I did a bike ride in 2003 where I rode, I connected up. I had a friend, actually, Joe Haptis, who was um, the coordinator of NARNS, and he went to, went on to go work at PETA. And I wanted to do, to do something because I, I ride my bike all the time. So I wanted to, like, put animal rights and biking together. So I was chatting with him about how we could kind of match the two up. And, and I said, well, I want to do a bike ride across the U S and like promote veganism. And he said, well, you have to narrow it down a little bit. You can't just <laughs> go out there. Any, but so it ended up being a, a protest against KFC because they had their KFC cruelty, um, their campaign just starting up then okay, about, yeah. mm-hmm. about them having basically killing the chickens nicer you know mm-hmm. <laughs> and of course it's tyson not not kfc doing the actual killing but the idea is you pressure kfc and then they ask tyson to kill the chickens nicer and you know it's easier to protest kfc than it is to protest tyson mm-hmm. so um i rode my bike across the u.s and i stopped at kfc's and did a little protest <laughs> this is great so like what what kind of uh route did you you you, you take Um, I went through Washington and then Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, and then a little bit Nebraska, Colorado, Kansas, um, Illinois, Kentucky, West Virginia. And then I ended up at at the PETA headquarters in Norfolk. Okay. 
Yeah. Was PETA like really supportive because you were really pushing this campaign for them? Well, yeah, I did it. I did it with them. I mean, they sent me, <laughs> they had a jersey made up that they sent out to me in this banner that I put on my, I had a, one of those Bob trailers that I put on there and they set up press conferences and all this kind of stuff. So I had all this, you know, I was, had all this PETA all over me and I, and I did kind of worry about how people would re- re- react to me and say Nebraska because I had PETA logos all over me and, and I knew people weren't exactly thrilled about PETA in <laughs> the farm country, but people were super nice actually. It, they accepted a couple when I was actually doing a protest at a KFC and then people would maybe yell things, but in between people were very nice. They didn't, they didn't, um, they weren't rude to me because I had all this like anti KFC stuff and PETA stuff all over. <laughs> was there a lot of logistics works to planning this or was it kind of like, fuck it, I'm doing it. Let's go. It was fuck it, I'm doing it. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> And so, and sometimes I think that was a little bit frustrating for my, the, my contact at PETA because they're like, well, where are you going to go? I was like, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm going to look this route and where are the, where's more of the KFC? So I'd have to try and, I mean, I kind of figured out my route as I went, quite honestly, is, is, and so they didn't have, t- we didn't have the route plotted ahead of time. So <laughs> they only knew maybe like a couple days in advance as to which city I'd be going through. And you can't, it's. I didn't have an exact schedule, so they'd be calling news stations and stuff like that um, maybe a day ahead of time, like, Ms. Bjork is going to be at this KFC doing a protest. <laughs> so, and, it, yeah, it wasn't very much logistics. It was just loading up my bike and going. How was it, like, planning the time <laughs> it took you to get, like, I don't know, because I've just never done it with a bike. I know <laughs> how long it takes me in a car to get to, you know, Denver from Salt Lake, but I can't imagine on a bike. It took, it was, well, because we did the protest at about 11 o'clock, so I only was able to really ride half the day. So I'd be just sitting around on days I did demos because you can't do a demo at nine in the morning. Yeah. KFC's not open. <laughs> and so, so I'd just be hanging out at my motel. Um, I had originally planned to camp, but that it was, it's just harder to camp when you have a whole, when you have literature and all this, this Bob trailer and, and if it's rainy. So I just, I just stayed in motels most of the time, except for occasionally with, I had um, activists put me up sometimes. Mm-hmm. So I think the, I was able to get in more writing on days when I didn't have a demo because I was able to start early, but a lot of the time, how long it takes to get somewhere is highly dependent on the terrain so if you're going up a mountain that takes longer, if you're in Kansas fighting a headwind, then you don't get very far at all. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it really, yeah, really depends on what, you know, where you're riding and the weather and stuff like that. I'm sure you got like lots of local support when you were going through places like uh, other activists showing up. But what percentage was it just you? Um, there was only occasionally, I would say when it was, when it was just me because in, in the PETA, it did end up sending somebody to meet me at some of the protests. So there'd just be, there would be more than just me because I just had a little roll up banner anyway. So they would um, fly in and be like, okay, no, they would drive. <laughs> 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 he would drive and he'd show up at the protest and then he'd go off and do something else. Cause sometimes it would take me an, a day to get more than a day. So I'd be at a demo and then it would take two days to get to the next KFC, depending on, on where I was. Cause there's a lot of, there's a lot of nothing in parts of Kansas and, yeah. and uh, Eastern Colorado. So, but uh, there was times like I'm, I'm when I was in Kansas in some little town in Kansas and this lady came, she saw me, she had no idea that this was going to happen, but she saw me and she was so happy. She's like, Oh my God, I didn't know anybody else around here cared about animals. And she told me about making a delivery to some dairy farm. And she thought it was so horrible. And she told her boss, she'd never go back there because she was a delivery driver. And so it was stuff like that, that the, the, this just random lady that saw me that was so thrilled. There was one other person in this world that cared about animals because she just didn't know anybody in Kansas <laughs> in her little town. So that was really cool is meeting people like that. And then some lady in, an, in another town that ran a motel and she took in all these stray animals and she was, you know, that person in that town that took in all the stray animals because nobody else would. It was things like that that were really neat to see that there was good people all over. With, with, uh, with being so memorable for you, is it something you would want to do again? Like not just want oh, yeah. to, but actively like I'm going to do this again. 
Well, I, it's the, the, I would like to, it's just a matter. I probably have to quit my job because it did take 70 days and nobody's going to give you two months off work. Yeah. And I had to quit my job to do the, the bike ride, which was fine. I mean, it was a good decision. I'm so glad I did it. And mm-hmm. if I were able to, I'd do it again. Um, but it, you know, would require me to find another job. <laughs> I wonder in how many of those locales it was the first time they've ever had an animal rights protest. Uh, yeah, I think it was. There was, I, I remember one news station, they didn't even know what PETA was. I thought, what? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I know. I'm like, really? Um, so yeah, there, there was for sure some locales where that was their first animal rights protest. And it was like an hour. So it wasn't a big deal. You know, you're standing there for, with a sign mm-hmm. for an hour. And, you know, it's not this huge, not like a lot of the protests that you and I would think about where there's more people and yelling or, or chanting or anything. It was just me hanging out there in my bike gear with a sign. <laughs> because, I mean, I remember um, this would have been 99-ish, maybe 2000-ish. We drove up to Wyoming. It was one of those uh, protest McDon- national protests against McDonald's days. And mm-hmm. so we did a protest here in Salt Lake in the morning. And then we drove up to Evanston, Wyoming to do one at night. And wow. everyone, like everyone, even the old people that were at McDonald's, they're just like, we're so glad that these kids are actually getting out there. We had one old guy. He's like, I'm so glad you kids aren't at the skate park and are here doing this instead. <laughs> We're like, it was like the weirdest experience. <laughs> well, when I was in Nebraska, the PETA wanted me to go in and talk to the managers, which I always felt weird about because they're just like kids. Right. You know I mean? Like they don't, yeah. Yeah. They don't have power. So I felt weird about asking the managers, but still, you know, they wanted me to go in there. And of course they would ask me to leave because I'm protesting their establishment. And, <laughs> So I, one of these times when I went and talked to them and I was leaving, there was this older guy in his Buick or whatever. And he, he's like, did they ask you to leave? I said, well, yeah, they did ask me to leave. I'm protesting them. Oh, well, that's not how we operate in, the, you know, whatever the town. I can't remember the name of the town. But he was <laughs> he was so upset that they had told me to leave because that was, like, just not hospitable. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, I love that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah but you know if that was happening all the time there then he would he would change his tone like <laughs> <laughs> probably <laughs> i think it helped that i was a female you know i, I was a lot more sympathetic to have a mm-hmm. woman out there so like having having that experience and, and working so closely with with PETA, um i have like like a, a love hate with PETA, and i'm, I'm sure you <laughs> probably have something very similar would that be correct yeah for sure i mean we still use their their vegan starter guides Mm because they actually are pretty good especially now that they took the celebrities off the cover um i didn't even know they did that that's how out of touch i am with that stuff (laughs) for a long time they had a bunch of celebrities on the cover and Mm -hmm. it always irritated me like "Ah." but it's got good good information inside i but um and finally they took the celebrities off because a lot of the celebrities you know, half of them aren't even vegan anymore, but <laughs> so, <laughs> they got to keep changing it. Um, and I appreciate that they give us the literature for free. And when we do circus demos, they send us stuff and some of their literature is good and some of it's bad. And, and I wish they would stop doing a lot of the really sensational stuff. Cause I kind of feel that, that it's, it's lazy in a way. Like you don't need to do the sex cell stuff anymore. I mean, aside from, how offensive that is to a lot of people. You don't need to do that anymore. You can do other forms to, of protest to get the media out there. I mean, I a couple of years ago they had they did one of their um, fashion police <laughs> demos in Seattle, and I had and I was sort of come. I was getting to the point where I really didn't. I wasn't comfortable with the you know naked demos and the sexy police demos but i hadn't i was kind of getting there but i hadn't really gotten there yet it was a slow because i I thought well women can make their own decision about whether or not they want to wear scanty you know skimpy Mm -hmm. clothing that's totally up to the person you're not taking advantage of the person so it took me a while to realize about that it was there was a good reason why it was offensive to other people but anyway so i was trying to get people to to be the (laughs) sexy policeman and they asked me and i was like ah i don't i don't know if i can couldn't fit in your outfit. <laughs> um, but I ended up doing it. I felt so weird because 
you know, it's not a whole lot of clothing and it's February and it's really cold. <laughs> and I remember thinking, God, I hope nobody from work sees me because that would be so awkward because I'm here in these really short shorts. And this is not something I would ever want someone at work to see me in because I would, I would just feel weird about it. And fortunately, nobody from work did come by and see me. And, and then after that, I was like, this is, it got a lot of media and mm -hmm. we've done, you know, for protests all the time and the media never shows up, but there's other ways to do that. And it really sends the wrong message because everybody's focused on the, what the, this person in <laughs> this next to nothing outfit rather than the issue at hand. So people don't really pay attention to what, why you're there. They're like, Ooh, it's a lady in short shorts and boots. and <laughs> Not. Yeah. So I don't, I, I wish they would stop doing that um, because I, again, you just don't need to. And uh, you're uh, perpetuating the idea that women are commodities. Yeah. And, and at what point is that, it, it stops being sensational, right? Like they've done it for so long. It's just, it's not sensational anymore. I don't think it will continue to bring the news. At least I hope it doesn't, you know, continue to bring the news coverage. I, I don't know. I mean, it's been a while since they've done something like that here. Cause the last couple of times they've, they've come, if it's, if it's one of those kind of demos, I just say, look, I'm not comfortable so advertising this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll send your info to other people I know that are still supportive of PETA stuff and aren't not going to, get involved in this because it's just not something we're comfortable with and i'm nice about it but i'm not i'm not gonna help advertise those kind of demos anymore if they want to come and do something else great but i'm not comfortable with the naked fashion police yeah, yeah <laughs> make there, out demos yeah, there was a demonstration here where someone came up to us and said aren't you PETA people supposed to be naked i'd like to see you naked to someone <laughs> oh god and that's the kind of like yeah that's the kind of thing that we don't want. <laughs> exactly, exactly, and and I I think Peta to their at least they realize that there's not as much support here, so I don't they don't really come out here to do those particular things, and and still Narn's a strong presence. So if they want to, if they want to do a demo, then then we can do a lot of the stuff like the circus demos. We take care of those, or mm -hmm. if there's something else in the area. Then they just say, can you go do this? And like we're gonna do it for free Friday, and I don't want to use their literature because people will just be dismissive, unfortunately. They're like, oh, you're PETA. <laughs> yeah. You know, I remember the the very first or, like organizing I ever did was completely on my own. I called PETA up and I'm like, hey, you know, I'm in 10th grade. They, I wanted to do something for dissecting at school. What can you help me do? And they sent me enough to set up a huge table. They sent me <laughs> banners and posters. And it was all just like, here, have fun. Send us pictures. You know, yep. and it was like amazing and it was so helpful. And, it, you know, it gave you that encouragement and and I loved it. And so, like, I have that, you know, I, I still hope they do that. I don't know if they do. So, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but, you know, they were always like really helpful to the grassroots, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s. So they are still really supportive. And that's the thing is, you know, you can be I'm sure there's other kids out there and in small towns and they call it pedo and they need help because they are really supportive. I mean, that's the thing is I agree with you. It's this love hate. Like I love that they are supportive, but I wish mm -hmm. they wouldn't do these other things. And they have done a lot for the animal rights community in general and the movement in general. It's just, I kind of feel like they're stuck a little bit in some of their tactics. So yeah. I, I love explaining to like um, a lot of newer people inside the animal rights movement. And you'd be like, did you know that PETA used to be the ALF press office? <laughs> like, like holy she like <laughs> yeah yeah they used to be a lot different <laughs> yeah they did and they're you know they still do i don't know i yeah <laughs> i did hear like the other day someone called in and got a poster and they said well if it's helpful you can cut off pita at the bottom oh yeah so i mean that's, that's fine <laughs> I, yeah i don't think i mean they they, they i do love they're just so supportive and I don't, I think they understand that there's, there's definitely people out there that aren't supportive because it's PETA and, and they just do want to get the information out there. Yeah. One of the things that at least makes me feel okay about a lot of it is like, I do believe that the people that are doing it, they honestly feel like what they're doing is the right thing for animals. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> and if I didn't feel that way, I would feel a lot differently about it. But you know, I'm not saying that everything they do is the best, but at least they're honestly trying, you know? Mm 
They work really hard. But anyways. <laughs> but intersectionality is important. And that's why. Like, it is. Yeah, it's super important. Yes. And I, I feel like that has that's that's hurt us a lot is because people they're people get into the idea like they the animals suffer the most, so forget about all these other movements and that just damages us because who wants to be part of that when mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all you care about is the animals. And yes, it's terrible for the animals, but that doesn't mean that other groups don't have a really hard time as well. And they're what they're going through is just as important. I mean that maybe they're not getting skinned alive or but their oppression is still very meaningful to them and it's you can't really compare them because they're both really bad so i mean we, we've talked about animal rights for a lot we talked a little bit about black lives matters but is there anything else that you really kind of put some of your time into any other issues um we've been trying to be really pay attention to what's going on with the food empowerment project because we want people to be aware of that you know you if you're buying chocolate then you shouldn't mm -hmm. be supporting slave labor so we totally. we're we haven't really been able to start up our own thing. We just try to kind of tap into what other groups are doing. So when the Food Empowerment Project brings up things about farm workers, then we try to be supportive of that. Um, I would say kind of when things pop up, then like, oh, this is really cool. Let's go support that because you should be paying attention to where bananas come from or <laughs> or chocolate or, or things like that. I, I think that's... Uh, I'm I'm really glad like you brought up the food empowerment project. I fucking love the work that they I, do. Yes, um, Lauren is yeah. amazing. Yeah, I have one of her leaflets right on my desk actually. <laughs> <laughs> and I honestly use that chocolate app every week. <laughs> I I love I have that info at my at my desk at work all about chocolate. Don't support you know child slavery and we shared around that list at at Halloween and. Because I if people just don't really think about it, and especially now, it's so easy to go find vegan chocolate that doesn't support child labor. And I mean, we have Theo Chocolate right in Seattle. Yeah, you can go buy it. It's not hard to find, and it's and at times it's frustrating to see that not all vegan chocolate is be careful is careful about where they uh, source their chocolate from. Yeah, I gave yeah. the list to my HR department for like all future events and stuff, and they're they're like super you know, excited and like, I had no idea we need to be more socially aware as a company, you know? And yeah. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> yeah. I was just completely ignorant until they, until they came out with that issue. Yeah. 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 So I'm glad that they did. I'm super glad. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that organization. And when I, you know, with things like organics, I mean, I understand, I don't really think organics are necessarily, healthier for people to eat but i try to try to emphasize about well you don't want people suffering and having pesticides blown all over the crop i guess organics still have some pesticides i'm a little confused about that but yeah they're just organic pesticides <laughs> right <laughs> I, I i know how that sounded but i would i mean they're organic compounds like yeah uh i don't know what are you gonna do it's like it's all bad yeah i know <laughs> agriculture fuck it um so so how how did you like first um get introduced to the food empowerment project um it was i went to one of the many i mean lauren goes all over the place mm -hmm. to to do, give talks and i actually remember a long time ago she was talking about child labor and chocolate but she hadn't started the food empowerment project yet so i think um I became aware that she started that a couple of years ago when she, she had stopped working at some other, when she basically started, I was kind of peripherally aware of it. And then she did a talk in, she came to Seattle because we have a, at the university of Washington, there's a group of professors that have started this critical animal studies um, group. And so they brought her to, to talk. And then I was reminded like, Oh my God, that's right. About all this <laughs> child slavery and chocolate and, so after she gave that talk, I kind of got paid more attention to to that because I was just reminded of the issue when she came to to give the talk. And and I've heard her at I mean she goes to a lot of the animal rights conferences. She just goes all over the place, which is great. Helps with the visibility. So I, her coming just helped renew my interest and and make sure that we paid more attention to things like that. 
so but i've known her for a while oh, okay yeah i just yeah i'm not well but, you know. yeah <laughs> <laughs> so if if i was to visit seattle right now what is where do i have to go a lot of people would tell you you have to go to wayward and it's i mean wayward is really good um plum is if you want a like a fancier meal and they do have they do have really good food <laughs> but it is more expensive than wayward i'm um, always looking for those hole in the wall hidden places that you're just like yeah this is the most amazing tamales you've ever fucking had <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. So you need to talk to Anika, who does, um, she started up a blog that's called a Vegan Score for that, mm -hmm. pretty much the sole purpose of, of, well, not the sole purpose, but she does talk about a lot of this stuff. Like, hey, there's this coffee shop in this corner and they have vegan pancakes or they have, so she finds all these things you never really, really thought about um, that are, that have vegan items or something that's or the best tamales ever. And so she has, and she has other people write um articles about it so that's that's right up her alley i'm not i only i know pretty much about places around my house that have good stuff but other than that it's like you know really good vegan places or i know places that have good tacos or that movie theater has vegan stuff <laughs> no you got to visit the the space needle as well obviously the space well <laughs> I drove by it one time. You gotta pay like fifty bucks to go up to the top. I think I think I was in it as a kid, and I I just remember they had glass coke there, you know, glass <laughs> coke bottles. That's the only thing I really remember. <laughs> so really, not that. I, I mean, it's nice, but it's you know you gotta pay a whole lot of money to go up there, and it's a good view and everything. But there's a whole lot of other places around Seattle that are free. I mean, you can go out to Alki and get a great view, or Golden Gardens, or. There's lots of other places. Go out to the take a ferry ride. I mean, there's there's tons of stuff that you get nice views without paying a whole lot of money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think I'll ever go there, honestly. <laughs> no. Not when you go to Vegas on that stratosphere. Is that a ride that goes around or something? Yeah, it's kind of like the Space Needle. It just has, uh, but it has roller coasters. It on has the top. a roller coaster on top. Yeah. Oh my god. That, that overhangs so the edge. And I've never also, done it. it also no, has no, I'm not I'm no swinging I'm scared chairs. of heights in certain situations. I think that would I would die. <laughs> Hold on, you're scared of heights in certain situations, but not in others? Well, it's weird because like I can I used to like Ferris wheels, but now they scare the crap out of me. Like <laughs> Oh fuck Ferris wheels. I I refuse to go on a Ferris wheel. Hey, I you're was, so funny about it. Years ago, I it was my idea to go on this Ferris wheel in Chicago because I was visiting a friend. I'm like, let's go on the Ferris wheel. And I get on the Ferris wheel and I was terrified. I kept like, don't move, don't move the car, don't move the car. It's like, I'm not. You know? <laughs> but I was so, <laughs> it was terrible. Um, and then I, tr I tried again on a Ferris wheel because I thought, well, maybe it was just the Chicago one. Maybe I can take this other Ferris wheel. And it was still the same, like, terrifying experience. And it was when it was even a smaller one and it was just me and this other like two of us on this first wheel and the guy who's running the ride was trying to do us a favor by leaving us at the top <laughs> it's it terrible um but i can i can be up on the space wheel and that doesn't scare me and i've been up on helicopters with no doors and that was fine so i don't I don't really know if I'm going to be scared until I get in the situation. Like I've been to the the Grand Canyon and I couldn't get too close to the edge. Yeah. But, but, uh, for whatever reason, going up in a helicopter is totally fine. <laughs> I mean, that's fair. I'm, I'm not really scared of heights, but I fucking hate Ferris wheels. So the only rides I love, I'm fine with roller coasters, but Ferris wheels, I, I get like the engineering behind it. But when I look at it mentally, I'm like, no, that's going to tip over. Like, <laughs> I I can't do pop up carnivals very easily. I my Cause... daughter convinced me to go on a Ferris wheel at a pop up carnival one time, and as we're going around, I saw two of the linkage hooked together with zip ties. Exactly, and I so noped the why. fuck out. I'm like, uh uh. <laughs> yeah, when you know that they use just like little like clips. pins that pop in and out. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think this will hold up. <laughs> but they do. My fear is not based in logic. It's just one of those things that's like I'm frightened of being up high for no good reason, really. For sure. Yeah, I have a my other kind of irrational fear is flying over water, not because of like 
anything except that if you do crash, then I'll probably drown because the crash will impact me so much that I won't be able to swim. So I'm like, <laughs> it's not that I, like <laughs> I know it doesn't make any sense because if you crash, you're gonna die either way. But I'd much rather die like on impact than die of drowning. <laughs> I think you're going to die in impact anyway. Probably. You know? <laughs> it's, it's irrational. I, I acknowledge this. <laughs> or you might end up on an island like lost. Well, and then we could actually put <laughs> and that And then you theory... can't be vegan anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, you have to eat that one rabbit that happens to be there. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it. I never thought about that situation. And if a monkey served you a meal, would you eat it? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, one of the things that, that I, I like to ask is, what is there anything inside the animal rights movement that you wish was happening or wish was happening more that you just don't see happening? I wish we would be more supportive of, I think there was more intersexuality. I really, you know, because I don't think there's enough of that. I think we, we get so very focused and, and, a lot of people are no, no, no. It's just the animals, and nothing else matters. And we do, we don't pay attention to the struggles that other groups are going through, and that just hurts us in the end. And I, and I don't think we don't pay enough attention, like the stuff that's going on in Israel. Um, th- I mean, it's great that there's there's a lot of veganism going on over there, but you've, people don't really pay attention to what's going on with the Palestinians. And so it's mm-hmm. like, we, we get so, um, we have such a narrow focus sometimes and, and it does frustrate me. And, and I still have discussions with people that are like, no, 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 it's just the animals. Nothing else matters. And, and why should you do anything about the black lives matter? And, and the, you know, it's so great that the people in Israel are going vegan in the Israel army, but never mind about them okay. shooting Palestinians. And, and and stuff like that. And there's still the idea of like, why should we care about what other groups are going through when the animals have it so rough? And they, they do, but you just can't, you can't dismiss what other people are going through. And why are they going to care about what happens to animals when they're just struggling to survive? If you mm-hmm. don't give a shit about mm-hmm. them, then why would they give a, a shit about what you're trying to talk about? So I wish people would, would maybe consider that a little bit and, and, just stop trying to put animal rights on everything because you know for i got involved in animal rights because it's just wrong it's just wrong what happens to animals and, and i don't think any that should happen to anybody and any kind of oppression is wrong and, and i wish people would kind of would apply that same logic to what goes on all around the world and that you really should care of the, that when anybody is oppressed how how, how do you um, find yourself approaching other activists like to to that intersectionally mindset, but not just you know that this is is wrong, but we need to go there in support of them, not to try to get support for us. It's hard conversation. I mean, some people get it, but other people are just don't want to listen, and I, and maybe that will take them more time, and maybe they'll never get there. So uh, I remember I was talking to some people, and they were telling me about a protest where this, and it was this woman's, I, I guess, you know, it was voluntary, but she was being, it, and I don't, I don't know exactly where this happened, but she was, it was in a very public area and she was being chased by two men who, who, who um, strapped her down and were trying to basically forcibly milk her. And they are describing this, like what an awesome protest this is. I thought that's awful. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Terrible. I was just horrified. And they, they thought, no, that's really great. You know, they're, they're showing what happens to female animals. I'm like, but that you, you, I was just like, and so wow. I was in a car with them. So I was able to have, I was able to, they were kind of forced to listen to me, I guess, about why that, that was, that was actually a terrible idea. And you're just perpetuating that the idea of violence towards women is okay. And, but I also understand that it took me a little while to, to reach that point of understanding why, yes, the woman in question was volunteering and it was, her, she, she personally wasn't being exploited, but she's just perpetuating this idea. And so I recognize that it does take people a little bit longer, especially if you yourself hasn't had to face any kind of discrimination. I mean, I, I've, I really haven't had to deal with what I recognize as sexism throughout my life just because I wasn't out. I don't know. Sometimes I'm a little oblivious. 
I mean, I, I've been a waitress and I had managers that were kind of creepy, but I just sort of like, well, whatever. I brushed it off. I didn't like think, oh, this guy is a total sexist. So it, it took me a while to kind of recognize things. Um, yeah. And see how that they were really important to other people. So I, I kind of try to remember that it, 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 it did take me a while. And so it might take them a while and just have conversations without attacking them or making them feel too defensive. How did the conversation with those one activists end? One of them was like, yeah, you're right. And the other was, well, I don't know. <laughs> so, hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully she'll think about it a little bit more. Cause actually the, the guy that was in the car was like, yeah, you're right. That's that you make a good point. But the, the woman was like, I don't know. It's still a good idea. <laughs> she just, she hadn't quite gotten it. And, but hopefully, Hopefully she'll she'll do some more thinking. That is such a tough situation. <sighs> yeah. I I hate it. I think when you yourself haven't had to face hardships, then it's hard for for you to be more sympathetic to to other people. Like you can, people will still make multiple excuses as to to why it doesn't matter or, or why people should just get over it or, or all these kind of things if they themselves haven't had to to deal with anything. So, and so many of us activists are very privileged white people. So it's Mm -hmm. to get white people to understand that they really are kind of part of the problem. A lot of times, if you're not recognizing your privilege and then people think, well, you're telling me that I'm wrong for being white, (laughs) but no, that's, you're just supposed to be aware of your privilege and, and use that in an effective manner. Not, not say that, not make excuses. You should be aware of it and see how it affects other parts of your life and affects other people. And it's not like you're doing something wrong by being white. You just need to recognize your mm-hmm. privilege. That, that brings up um, like a, another point that, that I think we, we fell out inside the animal rights movement it is the recognition of the privilege aspect of a lot of veganism and being able to focus on animal rights. Um, and then also the fact that the majority of vegans in the United States are female, but majority of organizers are male. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, you know, I've been, I've been leading Narn for a while now, but I think I've just seen that I think men tend to be louder and then women tend to be like, you know, we're just a, in a very general sense. So the guys tend to get more attention mm-hmm. when the, you got the women working there in the background. And so I'm lucky that, that I've been able to, to kind of, I don't, to stay the organizer of Narn. It's not like I don't have to have an, I, don't, I haven't faced somebody trying to come and usurp me or something. <laughs> but, but, you know, there's definitely situations where the guys are louder. And so people are like, oh, yeah, they're doing all this stuff, but maybe they're not. They're just louder. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's I guess, in, in some of our natures for the women to be a little on the, on the quieter side, but get shit done. And, um, and I'm not, I've always been kind of, not wanting a lot of attention on me. And that's also, I think part of society is telling women to tone it down. And I, I don't know. It's, it's definitely been going on a long time is that the, the guys are in the spotlight and the, the women are back there doing a lot of the work. <laughs> is, do, you, do you feel that that issue is being addressed inside the, the greater animal rights community or is it still just people recognizing that it's a problem, but not really trying to address it? I don't think they're trying to address it, but some of it is, is also, I don't know. It's, um, it's part, it's more of a societal problem at large. And Mm -hmm. if you want to, if you want to address it, then you're going to have to, then women are going to have to get more positions in the spotlight at spotlight. And that's something that's uncomfortable for some of us. We'd just rather be doing the work and not have all of the attention. We just want to get shit done and not, um, so I don't know. It'll, it'll, I guess it'll take a little longer, but I do think that it's slowly getting recognized, but there's still, there's still the hesitation to call out people. If you see somebody being, if you see somebody being a jerk, calling them out for that because people say, well, they're, they're really good animal rights activists. Never mind that they may be a total sleaze bag. Mm-hmm. They, <laughs> there's still an excuse as that they're a great animal rights activists. So never mind all this other shit they do. It's slowly getting better, but we still, there's, there's still that problem. 
one of the things that I know I've been guilty of, and and I'm super glad it was brought to my attention later on in life, was like when you're in like large consensus circles and things like that, that we fail at recognizing that people don't feel completely comfortable speaking up. They maybe process things differently and take longer time to reach decisions or come up with ideas or they're not they don't feel that empowerment so like you'd be like in these consensus you know environments and everyone would have an opportunity but it's a very short time frame very limited and and not really helpful and we just move on and then be like well people everyone had an opportunity but it's not an inviting opportunity you know what i mean yeah yeah i i try to make sure that i because i People say, oh, you're the president. Well, that's just a title. I mean, everybody is equally important. I'm good at certain things and other people on the board are good at certain things. And the woman, Kat, that runs our, our being in mentor program is hugely valuable. It's just everybody's really important. And I try to get that across to people is, is we're all in this together and we're all filling equally important roles. And your opinion is just as important as mine. So I try to to emphasize that so people feel comfortable with ideas and feel comfortable doing things. But it's I think people still feel hesitant to to be empowered or take on projects. They just want somebody else to to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't I can't believe it. We're already past an hour. This is <laughs> is flown by. Um, how can people, you know, follow the work that you're doing, follow Narn, and and get involved? Well, we have a website which actually we're working on revamping. It's, it's so out of date. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so you can look at our website and then there's a newsletter you can sign up for if you look below the calendar. So the website is just narn.org and then we have a Facebook page, Northwest Animal Rights Network. So those are two, two ways to follow up. And the newsletter, we put a lot of information in and we also put information in that other groups, if so, so if we know of demos or things that other groups are doing, then we put that in there. It's not all just NARN stuff. So if we hear about something else that's going on, we'll put that in the newsletter as well to encourage people to do things. And it's not necessarily about, it's usually about animal stuff, but if we see something else that's really cool that's going on, then we'll we'll put it in there. It's just a matter of whether or not we hear about it. So that's, that's uh, I know email is not as, people prefer Facebook, but the newsletter is a, a good way to follow what's going on. And, and they can always email me too, just Rachel at narn.org. I know you mentioned you have a, a poster making party coming up for the Black uh -huh. Lives Matter protest. Do you have anything else uh, on the horizon that's coming up for people? We have a potluck, a holiday potluck. Everybody loves potlucks, right? <laughs> 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 and God, it, it's so popular. Um, and that's, I think, on the 13th of December. And then we'll be doing, on the day after Thanksgiving, we have leafleting because there's a big parade downtown. So we're doing leafleting and then we're doing a uh, fur free Friday. Um, we kind of, I really don't like doing the, just the one-off protest, like let's do fur free Friday and then never do fur again. But, <laughs> <laughs> but Nordstrom's has continued to carry fur and they've also opened up a, a, um, a store in Vancouver. So we're trying to work with the Vancouver animal defense league to make sure that we were kind of trying to do some demos together since they're pressuring Nordstrom's up there and they have an ongoing fur campaign and we've kind of not touched the fur thing for a while because we've been focusing on all these other things, but I think it's time for us to, to revive that. So, so we'll be doing the fur free Friday, but we're going to continue to do fur demos because there's not really a lot of support for in Seattle. So I think people aren't aware that Nordstrom's carrying fur. So that that's going to be a lot of our focus is like, look, you guys, you think Nordstrom's is great. This is the kind of shit they're doing. They're selling coyote fur go tell them what you think. <laughs> um, and then we'll encourage people to go to the Black Lives Matter protest after that. That's awesome. And we'll be doing a lot of leafleting around the holidays because people go downtown to buy shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, well, I just wanted to say thanks for all the support that you guys gave me when I was in prison as well. Oh, you're welcome. We Oh, we do letter writing. Actually, that totally reminds me. Um, <laughs> this woman, Jenna, has started up our letter writing again, so we do monthly letter writing. And our next one is on December 1st. And we'll be focusing on, on fur, but we always have a list of prisoners and things like that to encourage people to write letters. So we've started up again, thanks to Jenna, thank, thank God, because we've been wanting to do that for a while, but we just didn't really have anybody to, to make sure those events happen. So she's doing them on a monthly basis. Awesome. That is awesome. I, lo I love to hear how busy you guys are. Um, <laughs> I always think we're not busy enough. Like we're <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, Sounds plenty busy. Yeah, it <laughs> totally does. Um, well, we end every episode uh, saying fuck shit damn. Would you mind saying it for us this week? Fuck shit Dan. Da- That's it? Damn. Damn. Fuck shit damn. Yep. Sweet. <laughs> we got to get our explicit rating somehow. Yes. <laughs> This week you heard Leading Babylon by Blue Tech. Right now you're listening to Lobe Grinder by Beretta. Did you know that there's a Leaving Babylon that, that Bad Brains did? Is there like a Destroy Babylon that some hardcore band did? Uh, that does wouldn't surprise me. iTunes, come on. If you listen this far, you can take one extra minute out of your day and write and review us on iTunes. It's the least you can do. I mean, we're providing this content to you for free. Unless you paid for it. Unless you paid for it, which you're already getting some awesome stuff by being a member. Which so- podcast.com. <laughs> on the member tab. But it really helps us out. If you can't afford to become a member, if you can't afford to buy stuff on the collective shop, or you just don't like the shit, which is fair enough, you listen to it this far, give us some ratings. Give us that rating love. Give us some feedback, even if that's what you want to do. Tell us what we could do to improve the show. I don't know. Yeah, give it. Say five stars. You guys kind of suck. I wish you were more organized. Just give us the five stars and then the criticism. I wish you guys weren't anarchists. I mean, doesn't mean that we're gonna listen, but you know, <laughs> you can say whatever you want. If you haven't yet become our friend on social media, you should do so. We often talk about things on there that we don't talk about on the show, and by often, pretty much every day. So be our friend, like us, follow us. Which side podcast.com, click on the social tab. Cool, cool, cool. If you're looking for something to buy, check out the Witch Side Media Collective store. Just go to witchsidecollective.org. Check out all the stuff that we have to offer. Everything goes back into the collective so that we can help fund other projects. So do it. We we don't even have everything in the the, the store, but uh, I really want the uh, vegan AK forty seven hoodie. I want a lot of that stuff. I know, me too. So if you want to give us a gift, hey, we yeah, take it totally. <laughs> is, it, shit, is it that is it the fuck shit damn part? I think it's fuck shit damn time. Uh, is that good enough, or do we need to say it again? Probably one more time. Okay, you ready? Mm-hmm. Uh, go. You're fine. Fuck shit down. <laughs> Which side podcast is hosted and produced by Jordan Halliday and Jeremy Parkin of the Which Side Media Collective, with web design by Jordan Halliday and sound design by Jeremy Parkin. Booking by Mari Halliday. Theme music by Commandantes. Go to WishSideCollective.org to check out the other shows in the collective. As always, fuck shit damn. <laughs>